Hello everyone, welcome to Bread and Roses. We hope you're fine. I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Borspuya. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about Turkey's attack on Rojava and Syrian Kurdistan and its effects not only for the region but for the entire world. Interview this week is with Rahila Gupta, an interview which broadcast previously but because of its relevance we are going to share that with you again. Stay with us, don't go away. The Turkish government has uh, made an all-out assault against Rojava and northern Syria. And we know the human cost has been great. People are being killed. There are thousands upon thousands of people who are fleeing the area now in order to reach safety. And we've all seen really horrific images of children, men and women who are being killed. And of course, I think apart from the human tragedy of this uh, attack is the um, effect that this attack is going to have, not just in the region, but internationally. Because Rojava has become a shining light for people across the world. You're talking about a place which is in a war zone, but nonetheless, it is bringing forth an experiment that is feminist, that is secularist, that is humanist. You have seen in that area a ban of Sharia courts, an end to child marriages, uh, a sort of council rule in which people are involved in democratic politics all the way from the bottom up. And women are playing a key role in, uh, in that society. So, you know, Turkey's attack against Rojava is attack against the possibility that another world is possible and I think that's why so many governments remain silent and Turkey has been given the go-ahead including by the US in order to try to destroy this dream really that's being implemented. Why are these governments not stopping Turkey or in reality support, supporting Turkey with its military um, invasion of Rojava? The reason is because health care is free at the point of need. Education is free at the point of need for everybody. People have the right to participate, free participation. In the last two and uh, three years that Rojava has existed, there's been peace in, in, in the area. People have actually gone back to the normal life. They've participated fully in uh, development of and, and control of society and that shining light in the region where it was surrounded by uh, ISIS, most reactionary elements, Saudi Arabia uh, funded groups, Iranian, Hezbollah, Syrian government, Russian bombardment, right in middle of that area and that region, suddenly you have a liberated area that it actually give, gives you an alternative a way and organization for the society. That's why every single reactionary government, and let's not mince our word, the European governments, NATO allies, United States, and all the regional governments, all of them have been supporting Erdogan with this policy because they don't want to see, and people in the region to see the possibility of an alternative way of organizing society. Yeah, definitely. And I think not just the people of the region, I think people of the world were seeing the failure of, uh, you know, Western democracies as well. And the fact that, you know, this sort of council rule, which gives real democratic control to the public, uh, to the population, all the way from the bottom uh, to the top, is uh, another way of organizing and it shows that another way is is possible and of course we see how refugees again you know the most vulnerable in uh, every society in the world the most disenfranchised the most deprived you know using refugees again in order to further reactionary aims we've seen how Erdogan even mentioned at the UN General Assembly that he's going to bombard the area because he wants to create a peace a, a corridor a peaceful corridor for Syrian refugees to go to. He's creating more Syrian refugees. How is this a peaceful corner? And also, the minute there's any sort of 
condemnation from a few governments. We hear how er Erdogan is threatening to release a flood. Again, the sort of negative language about people who are merely trying to reach safety, that he's going to flood Europe with refugees. Again, you know, the use of refugees uh, as a way of silencing criticism and also allowing reaction and inhumanity to carry on without any question. And one of the consequences of the military invasion of Rojava is reorganization of uh, ISIS and the most reactionary elements. The uh, uh, Most of the uh, front line of the uh, Turkish army are the old Islamists who have always been protected by the military uh, of the Turkish government and now there are actually the advanced sort of line of attack against Rojava and we'll see the consequence one of the consequences of this invasion would be rise of ISIS and the Islamists. Uh, we've heard in the last couple of days that the, those ISIS militants or the ISIS uh, fighters who were uh, imprisoned by the uh, um, democratic forces in Rojava. Now they've, they've heard that the uh, um, Turkish army is approaching. They are making attempts to uh, escape uh, from the camps and join the Turkish army. And this is a disaster for the region and people everywhere. Mm. Well, one of the things though that's very clear is that people do understand uh, the importance of Rojava for all of us. You know, it is our fight really and that's why we see so much organizing and solidarity actions taking place across the world. We need to keep that uh, going, we need to keep the pressure on. Every feminist, every secularist, every humanist, every human being that believes that people deserve to live lives that are worthy of the 21st century must unequivocally support Rojava. This is our fight. This is a fight for a different future, the possibility of a better future. Rojava is something that we must defend. If it dies, our dreams die. And that's something that we mustn't allow to happen. No matter what happens, and we all must make sure that Rojava survives and we must support Rojava we, and by any means that we, uh, uh, we, we can uh, assist in, uh, in resistance. Uh, against the in, uh, Turkish invasion, Rojava is not going to die because the experiment have shown the light to everybody. They've, they've turned on a light that everybody could see. Yeah. We have to rise up for Rojava. Gupta, it's a great pleasure to have you on our program. You've been to Rojava, you've written about us. Tell us how such a project for gender equality can be possible in such difficult circumstances. Yeah, well, that's a question I asked myself as well before I actually made the trip to Rojava. And it really is something, if you've never heard about it before, it's something that you wouldn't believe. Uh, that was my initial reaction. Um, and I think I was probably one of the last journalists to be able to cross the border because all the borders are shut as well. So it's very, very isolated. Um, and what I found was really amazing. Um, I, there is um, an experiment that's going on in radical democracy. So it's, um, it's about direct participatory democracy, so neighborhoods form into communes and every and at every commune is led by a man and a woman and there are several committees on that so it'll there'll be a committee to deal with health issues or education or what they call conflict resolution which is often to do with domestic violence and each of those will be led by a man and a woman and then it goes upwards to the next level and the next level and the next level up to the city level um, and and they all elect the next uh, level of leadership. Parallel to this, so there is this uh, whole system that you know, energizes society, is a whole autonomous women's structure as well, which makes sure that there's a feminist perspective on every single issue. And they have the same structure, so they have, but except that it is women only, so they will have you know, committees at the neighborhood level and right up to the city level. Um, so, if you talk in terms of, you know, uh, in order to 
make sure that there is gender equality? Do you tilt the field in favor of women? Yes, you do. You have to. Now, this is going on in the middle of war. Syria, as everybody knows, is completely war-torn. What do we hear about this place? I mean, I am shocked by the level of ignorance about Rojava in the West, amongst progressive people, amongst politically active people. Partly it's to do with the fact that the media is not interested. When I was crossing the border, I met journalists who were going straight to the front line, because what they want is war, brutality, violence. And there is a society behind all of this, which is really, I would argue, the most radical uh, democracy, attempt at building a radical democracy in the world. And so it takes you back on many different fronts because, you know, there's the whole kind of clash of civilizations narrative in the West, you know, that there is this monolithic Islamic backward culture and you have you know all the the best values in the world are attached to western civilization respect for democracy human rights equality etc etc and then here you have in syria a part of uh, it so i have to tell you the geographical it's it's the northern most strip of syria going from east to west and it's kind of bordering the turkish uh, the, the southern part of Turkey and on their south they are facing the ISIS uh, so-called caliphate and and one of the reasons uh, that we sometimes um, hear about them in the West is because we see the women's defense forces out there fighting the good fight against ISIS Now they've been the most effective fighting force against ISIS, so they've had uh, the advantage of American air cover. But you know, it's America has uh, a particular uh, project there, it wants to get rid of ISIS. Um, and so the, the support that it's giving Rojava is very, very qualified. And what's going to happen, I, I suspect, I fear, is that all of these people are as soon as the war against ISIS is won and the Rojava forces will win this uh, fight. Uh, they have been incredibly disciplined. Um, they are very reliable. There is none of the ragtag internecine fighting of the rest of the Syrian rebels. Um, there is none of the um, kind of conservative uh, religious, you know, uh, ideology driving. This is a totally secular um, uh, state, and I'll come to that in a in a little while. So basically, they that that is one of the reasons we've heard a little bit about them is because they have this effective fighting force against ISIS, and they are moving on Raqqa as we speak. Apparently, it's entered the third stage. So, but once ISIS goes. Um, what could have been a model solution for the rest of Syria if there were these self-governing administrative areas like the ones that have been set up in the north across Syria where the local people themselves could participate in the whole political process and decision making, I think we would have a way forward. But I think it's too dangerous uh, as, a, as an idea because it's anti-capitalist. It's uh, very, very into uh, sustaining the, um, talking about sustaining the environment and taking ecologically sound decisions. Um, and all of this is, uh, I mean, people ask, so how did this come about? You know, why, why did this happen? How come? So it really is um, the one unsung example of the success of the so-called Arab Spring, because um, in 2011, when, when there were all these uh, uprisings across the Middle East, similar uprising took place amongst the Kurdish community in, uh, in the northern part. And um, because Assad was very keen on uh, focusing his firepower on the rebels in the south, he basically left them to get on with it. When you talk about how the system is set up, but what are some practical ways in which women's rights are being protected and promoted? Okay, well, the Women's Ministry only set up in January 2014, and since then they have abolished um, 
dowry, they've abolished polygamy, they've abolished or criminalized or banned forced marriage, honor killings. Um, the, the Sharia uh, system has been disbanded. It's the only part of Syria in which the Sharia courts have been totally disbanded because you've got the Sharia system under the Syrian rebels and you've also, and Assad, for Assad, that was the way in which he delivered justice to all his religious minorities. So that's been abolished. And what I thought, particularly as an Indian, I thought one of the things which is really interesting Interesting was not just ending forced marriage, but criminalizing anybody who stops a woman getting married of her own free will. You know, so a so-called love marriage, if that is stopped in its tracks, that person, that family would be criminalized. So these are quite amazing things. And when I met um, a group uh, called Sara, which I suppose the closest um, in the parallel would be South Hall Black Sisters, um, they were saying that since all the legislation had passed, they thought, felt that, you know, violence against women had halved. So they're saying, none of them are saying that we have arrived Everybody talks about the thousands of years in which patriarchy has been entrenched. But you know, the, in, it's so, in so many different ways. I mean, I, when I was there, I was hosted by different families. So every night I spent a different night in, with a different family. So I got to see, you know, families you know, and how they operated in quite an intimate setting. And, you know, one woman who had been married at the age of 14 and had seven kids and had been illiterate, um, was now, since the revolution, had been going to classes in Kurdish and she learned, so, you know, she could now read and write and when we were watching TV and if it was subtitled, she would delightedly point to the words and, you know, read them out. So, and, and, and then she also started, because her kids have all grown up now and she says, you know, I will never, I will never uh, force or ch choose their husbands for them, for the daughters, they can have their own marriages. Um, and she also does conflict resolution, so she goes off to her local commune <coughs> and will go and, you know, talk to families where there is violence and try and resolve it. And of course, if it's not resolved, then they have to go through the court system. Do you feel that this magnificent movement is getting the support that it needs from people who are progressive and living outside of Rojava in the West, for example? Well, I'm actually really disappointed by the uh, what I would have expected to um, from you know progressives to support this. Um, I've been really disappointed. So, for example. Um, I think partly to do with the fact that they have had, Rojava has had both the support of the Russian uh, army from time to time, as well as the Americans, both of them imperial forces have made, have made the traditional left rather suspicious. As far as the Rojava people are concerned, they say, we have to take, we have to be practical, we have to take whatever support we can get. We do not have the armaments and, and we do not have, you know, basically the resources to fight somebody like ISIS, so we need to do that. Um, then I find that the feminist uh, movement, uh, although I find that particularly baffling, you know, so, so like the uh, Women's International Peace uh, League, um, they, they are uh, not supporting it and I can't actually get to the bottom of it. I mean, they're talking about the amount of Syrian women who are doing human rights work in the rebel areas and are disappointed that they have only 2% representation of women in the councils over there and they're talking in terms of we should lobby the funders to pr make sure that aid is dependent on 30% uh, representation of women. So then I asked them, but in Rojava there's 40 to 50% representation of women without you know, conditionalities on aid. Why aren't you supporting that? And I think part of it is they cannot get their head around the issue of non-violence that, the, that they have faced, a tradition. they have supported a tradition of non-violence and seen militarization as something that is uh, masculine and, and have not fully understood that self-defense um, uh, is really important and that non-violence can be a privileged position for people who don't face that kind of dilemma. So you don't get you know, support from that group of people. Then you have other um, uh, commentators and left-wing uh, organization groups here who support the Syrian rebels and when you ask them, but the Syrian rebels actually, you know, first of all, as we know that the rebel army is just a ragtag 
group of you know various Islamist uh, organizations and don't you think we ought to be confronting the fact that if these if these rebels were successful what kind of a post Assad society are we talking about you know where is your support for secularism and they are not prepared to um, counter to 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 understand uh, these issues all they see is Assad is a dictator we have to um, uh, you know unseat him in any shape or in any way we can and not really looking at who are the people who are doing the unseating and of course there are some groups <coughs> on the left that support the Assad regime yes but I guess the the main issue is Rojava is a it's raining women you you say in one of yeah. your articles what I mean, I guess the question is, it, it does hold something really important and even as a symbol for what could possibly be in the Middle East and North Africa. It, could, it represents for the world, a different world. Yeah. I mean, even for the world. Yeah. I, I think that its ambitions and its aspirations are um, un, you know, unmatched. I think even in the West, we are simply do not have that level of ambition about uh, the kind of society we want to see. And I think it is such an important experiment. It is so important to support it that I really think, first of all, we need to spread the word. You know, people need to know about Rojava. But it requires, the kind of support it requires, I feel, is like lobbying at that level of, you know, Turkey needs to back off. But if Turkey has to back off, America has to put pressure on Turkey. What kind of an American president do we have at the moment? You know, it's like um, the, uh, there's about you know ten or fifteen foreign powers with the real interest in that area, which is what's making it really difficult to marshal support for Rojava. But as an idea, the fact that this experiment can be even tried in a war-torn area with no medicines, you know, shortage of food, all sorts of uh, issues and complications, people migrating into and leaving, you know, there's a huge amount of refugees coming in, nobody's paying um, as the blindest bit of heat to that. They need aid for that. You know, Mosul, now that Mosul is um, coming, well, probably the war there is coming to an end. There are refugees entering Rojava from there. So they are facing a really difficult situation. And to, to be able to have this, you know, this not just to say that another world is possible, but in fact that another world is here and we are making it and we are creating it. We, all of us, really need to support it. So I feel very passionate about Rojava. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you.